Good day everyone. Today I will be discussing computer system structure. Let us first define computer system. A computer system is a basic, complete, and functional hardware and software set up with everything needed to implement computing performance. There are core aspects of computing that a computer system has to facilitate. The ability to receive user inputs is the first step. Then there's the big processing ability. There is also the ability to generate data for storage and output. What you see in the diagram is a computer system block. The hardware and software components of a system or of a computer system are both present. The hardware components are physical components that are mounted within the computer case and some of which are also externally connected. The computer system must be directed to perform various user-specified operations which necessitates the use of a program that directs the computer hardware. The term software also refers to a computer program. So, what are the components of a computer system? As mentioned earlier, computer system has two primary components. First is the computer hardware. Now, the computer hardware are the tangible parts of the computer system. They are classified into four types. The uh, input device, like the mouse and the keyboard. The output device, like the uh, printer and the uh, monitor. The processing device, which is our uh, CPU or the central processing unit. And the storage devices, which are uh, the hard disk drives okay, and some of the uh, 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 storage media like uh, the CDs, the USBs, etc., etc. The second component is the computer software. Now, these are the intangible part of the computer system. They are also known as programs or applications. Now, computer software are classified into two classes namely system software and application software. Now, other softwares may also include scientific software, embedded software, product line software, web applications, and artificial intelligence software. Now, in addition, or additional component is the liveware, also known as peopleware. They are the computer users like us. The user commands the computer system to execute on instructions. We now go to computer boot up. Let us first define some terms. Boot refers to as boot up or sometimes start up. Booting is the process of powering on a computer and getting into the operating system. Next is BIOS, which is short for Basic Input Output System. The BIOS, or pronounced as BIOS, is a ROM chip found on motherboards that allows you to access and set up your computer system at the most basic level. Next, we have the ROM or the read-only memory. Now, the ROM is a type of storage media that permanently stores data on personal computers and other electronic devices. Now, ROM uh, contains the programming required to start a computer, uh, which is required for boot up. Now, it handles major input-output tasks and stores programs or software instructions. This type of memory is known as firmware and how it is altered has been a source of design consideration throughout the evolution of the modern computer. Now, a BIOS 
operating system and hardware components must be or must all be operational in order for it to boot. Any of these three elements failing will most certainly result in a failed boot sequence. Next is the CPU utilization. Now, the CPU utilizes itself when the computer power is first turned on, which is triggered by a series of clock ticks generated by the system clock. Now, the CPU will look at the system's ROM BIOS for its first instruction in the startup program as part of its, its initialization. The first instruction, which is the instruction to run the power on self-test or the POST, is stored in a predetermined memory address by the ROM BIOS. Next is the uh, post checks. Okay, uh, the BIOS chip first, then the CMOS RAM. Okay, if the POST does not detect a battery failure, it continues to utilize the CPU, inspecting the inventory hardware devices such as the video card, secondary storage devices such as hard drives, ports, and other hardware devices such as the keyboard and mouse to ensure they are operational. Next is the BIOS looks for an operating system to load after the POST or POST has determined that all components are function functioning properly and the CPU has successfully initialized. We now go to boot sequence. Boot sequence is the order in which a computer searches for non-volatile data storage devices containing program code to load the operating system. Now, boot sequence is also called as boot order or BIOS boot order. To explain the given uh, or the shown uh, illustration, okay, on how boot sequence operates. Now, first is the power on self-test or the POST or POST, which is the first diagnostic test performed by a computer when it is turned on, comes before the boot sequence. Now, boot sequence begins on once POST is completed. If there are any issues during the POST process, the user is notified by a beep codes, POST codes, or on-screen post error message. Unless otherwise specified, the BIOS looks for the operating system on drive A first, then on drive C, and so on and so forth. The boot sequence can be changed uh, via BIOS settings. In some computers, uh, before when you turn on the computer, you simply continuously press on the delete button or sometimes it is F2. It depends on your... Uh, uh, computer system okay now to enter the BIOS and change the boot sequence different BIOS models have different key combinations and on-screen instructions as I have uh, mentioned earlier like pressing the delete button continuously once you turn on the computer or pressing the F2 or F5 uh, function key now normally after the post BIOS will attempt to boot the first device in the BIOS boot order. If that device is not suitable for booting, the BIOS will attempt to boot from the second device listed and so on until the BIOS finds the boot code from the device instead. If the boot device is not found, the system crashes or freezes. And an error message is displayed. An unreachable boot device, boot sector viruses, or an inactive boot partition can all cause errors. We now go to exemptions 
traps and interrupts or interrupts now exemptions are rare events that are triggered by the hardware and force the processor to execute an exception exception handler now exceptions can occur as a result of an instruction internal interrupts or hardware malfunctions let's say for example your uh, keyboard is not connected on your cpu now there are four classes of exceptions interrupts traps faults and aborts now interrupts is a signal informing a program that an event has occurred when a program receives an interrupt signal it performs a predetermined actions which can be which can be to ignore the signal now interrupt signals can cause a program to be temporarily suspended in order to service the interrupt next is traps traps is triggered by a user program to invoke operating system functionality now traps are raised by the user program in order to invoke an operating system functionality now assume that the user program requires something to be printed on screen it would set up uh, set off a trap and the operating system would write the data on the screen traps are primarily primarily used to execute system calls next we have faults now faults or page faults some call it page faults occurs when a program attempts to access data or code that is in its address space but is not currently located in the system ram lastly we have the uh, abort now abort happens when a program or function stops before it has finished naturally now the term abort refers to both requested and unexpected terminations now when a program terminates you are typically returned to the operating system shell level in contrast to abort crash renders the entire system including the operating system unusable next we have the uh, input output structure or the io structure Okay, the primary role of the, the operating system is computer input output is to uh, manage and organize I.O. operations in all I.O. devices. Now, an I.O. port usually consists of four different registers. These are the uh, status, control, data in, and data out. Now, the uh the status registers or register holds bits which can be read by the host the uh, control register is written by the host for starting a command or for changing the mode of any device the uh, data in register is read by the host for getting input and the data out register is written by the host for sending output now, data registers are usually 1 to 4 bytes in size. Now, some of the uh, controllers have FIFO or the first-in, first-out chips, which holds several bytes of input or output uh, data for expanding the capacity of the control beyond the size of the data register. Next, we have the storage structure. The storage system provides the fundamental system for storing a date uh, datum and holding it until it can be retrieved at a later time. The speed, the cost, the size, and volatility of each storage device vary. Now, secondary storage is used to supplement main memory. Secondary storage devices can keep data indefinitely. Now, storage devices consist of registers, cache, main memory, electronic disk, magnetic disk, optical disk, magnetic tape. 
types. Now, there are two types of storage devices. The volatile storage device and the non-volatile storage device. Now, volatile storage device, uh, it loses its contents when the power of the device is removed. Like, for example, the RAM or the uh, random access memory. A non-volatile storage device, it does not lose its contents when the power is removed. It holds all the data when the power is removed. In uh, the shown storage device hierarchy, all the storage devices are arranged according to speed and cost. The higher the level or the higher levels are expensive, but they are fast. As we move down the hierarchy, the cost per bit generally decreases whereas the access time generally increases. Now, storage system above the electronic disk are volatile, while as those below are non-volatile. Now, our last topic is the hardware protection. Okay, so the hardware protection, now, so to ensure proper operations, we must protect the operating system and all other programs and their data from any malfunctioning program. Protection is needed for any shared resource. Okay, hardware protection is divided into three categories. The uh, uh, input-output protection, the memory protection, and the uh, CPU protection. Now, the I.O. protection means providing unauthorized input-output instructions, accessing memory locations within the operating system, or refusing to surrender the CPU, a user software can interrupt the system's normal operation. We may utilize a variety of techniques to uh, ensure that such uh, systemic disruptions do not occur. Next is the uh, memory protection. Now, we must secure the interrupt vector from altercation by a user program in order to assure proper functionality. Now, in addition, the interrupt service procedures in the operating system must be protected from altercation. Even if the user did not obtain illegal access to the computer, Changing the interrupt service routines would most likely cause the computer system spooling and buffering to fail, which will be discussed on the later uh, discussion. Next and lastly, we have the computer or the CPU protection or the central processing unit protection. Now, we must ensure that the operating system maintains control in order to protect input, output, and memory. We must prevent a user program from becoming trapped in an infinite loop or failing to call system services, resulting in the operating system losing control. We can utilize a timer to achieve this purpose. A timer can be used to interrupt the computer after a certain amount of time has passed. Now, the duration might be either fixed or flexible. A fixed rate clock and a counter are commonly used to build a variable or a variable timer. And that's it for this uh, discussion. Thanks for listening.